today's senior speeches. Our first speaker today is Aiden Romero. Hello, everybody. Does anybody know what day it is today? Thank you so much, thank you so much. Big 18, man. You know, with the timing of all this, the speech and the birthday and the senioritis, I've, I've had to think a lot about growing up. Us seniors especially have had to do a lot of growing up recently. There's a lot going on for us. There's college apps and adulthood and burdens and freedoms. Some of us voted on November 5th and some of us will vote next time. You know, we've had to think about money and future and life and love, and we've had to change to adjust to it all. We've had to learn to think hard about ourselves in ways we never hoped to have to. And you can feel it in the halls as you walk by us. You can feel our mature aura. You can, you can smell our stress. You know, they say that senior year is the last year before you graduate high school. And that's... It's a little scary. You know, I, I mean, every year of my life before this one, I've wanted to grow up. But now it's, it's really scary and it's, and it's hard. And I empathize with all of you because it's not just seniors. You know, everyone's dealing with a lot at the same time. And school is stressful and politics is stressful and hormones are cranked to 10 around this time of life. And I'm feeling that with all of you. I, I do think, however, I've, I've recently been particularly good at managing it all and organizing and understanding all the feelings in my mind. I know I have been because while I was chilling outside class before a book quiz, Izzy and Jordan came walking down the hall, they spotted me, and they were like, Oh my god, Aiden, you're so nonchalant, I'm bothered king. <laughs> and it's, it's funny to me to think of myself that way because a little while ago I was really anything but nonchalant. I mean, middle school me stressed out and yelled and fought people. And when high school hit, I took a big t emotional turn and I, I cried a lot. I worried a lot. I was scared a lot and I withdrew myself a lot. And, and I, I struggled with wrapping my head around my mind. But my saving grace came at just the right time during my sophomore year. And her name was Stoicism Club. We met every Friday or so during clubs and during our meeting, many meetings, we explored topics like change, loss, desire, love. And now that Stoicism's greatest philosophers, Smith, Levitch, Robbins, Simpson, etc., have graduated, I feel some responsibility to spread their knowledge. So my goal today is to clue you into some of the big ideas so that you can set out on your own path. Now, the major misconception about Stoicism is that it's all about achieving a state of not caring. But that is entirely untrue. The ideal Stoic has just about as much care as anyone else, maybe more. But they only focus on caring about the things that they should, things that they can impact, things that they have agency over. And to make the philosophy easily digestible, I've boiled it down to the following process. Let's imagine we have a problem, an issue. A pickle of sorts. Now before we make any decisions about our particular pickle, we're going to ask ourselves a question. Can we do anything about it? Now let's say the answer is yes. Well now we don't have to worry about it. We can just go do the thing, take care of it, right? Now how about the answer is no? Well let's think through it. If our pickle is entirely independent of us, decided by devices apart from our own, and no sweat broken or tears shed, can change it, then we need not spend our precious time worrying about it, right? Now let's try applying this approach to a real life scenario. Now let's say we're a little hungry. Just a hypothetical. Can we do anything about it? You bet we can. In a few minutes, Big Z's gonna get us right with some snacks. We're gonna take one chip and one fruit and we're gonna say thank you. Shout out Big Z. Now let's try another one. 
let's say we're getting older and everything around us is changing and places are changing and people are changing. Tomorrow seems oh so uncertain. Our friends might leave us. We might leave them. We might leave our town and our families and our dogs and everything we've grown so used to our entire lives. Our life past high school might not be all that we dreamed of. Can we do anything about that? A little, sure. We'll work hard to get pretty grades and heaps of extracurricular activities. And maybe we'll work part-time to build experience. Maybe we'll practice playing bass for a few hours a day in hopes of being a blues-based savant. And maybe we'll write a real personal and thoughtful personal statement about bees. Maybe we'll do everything we can to give ourselves options, but once we hit submit on those applications, and while we're waiting for a call back after an interview and an audition, then there's nothing left for us to do to change the decisions that will shape our future. So now it's time for us to just stop worrying, right? Nothing we can do now, so it doesn't matter, right? Who cares? I say that a lot to people who are stressing out. I say, bro, why worry about it? That won't change anything. It doesn't matter now. Just be cool, yo. And a lot of people before me have stood up here and told us not to worry, not to care so much about that stuff, but even after hearing all their senior knowledge and after learning in stoicism, I'm still scared. And I, I worry a lot about stuff I can't control. And in a really non-stoic way, I've spent a lot of time recently trying to find ways to take control of things I have no control over. And honestly, I thought I had totally lost the plot in these past few weeks, but Something happened yesterday. I ran into yet another well-timed philosophical knowledge bomb. <sighs> I was sitting on the john, watching LeBron edits on TikTok. <laughs> and I ran into this account called La Positivity One. <laughs> they posted this slideshow of Bron Bron with the Rio de Janeiro filter and a really impactful quote. And it goes like this. If you build a beautiful garden, the butterflies will come to you. And it doesn't sound very stoicism adjacent, but I'll circle back to it. But first, let's go back to our first scenario, a little pickle. Things are changing. We're worried. We've done all we feel like we can about it. And we're still out here caring. You're caring. I'm caring. It doesn't make any sense for me to just straight up tell you not to care anymore. And it's not right for me to say my usual, it doesn't matter, because you care, and I care, and because you care and I care, it does matter. And I could not, in good conscience, make the only takeaway of this speech be, well, any time you have a problem, ask yourself this little question, and if the answer's yes, then go do the thing, and if the answer's no, then just, like, don't worry about it. And sure, it still stands for the smaller stuff. Like, for example, right after this, I'm gonna go do the thing. I'm gonna go max some chips and a banana. But when those big things come up, when you're scared of growing up and college decisions and auditions, I can't just ask you not to care. Instead, I'm gonna ask you to think about the La Positivity quote. It's still true that you won't be able to control the things that you can't control, but there's always something you can do to prepare. You can always work on building your beautiful garden. And for me, well, I mean, that looks like working on my sense of love and working on caring about the things that I should care about and working on smiling and loving through whatever comes my way. And for everyone, that'll look different. But that's the thing I was looking for. That's the way to take control. When I'm freaking out about the future, I can take control by building my beautiful garden, by working on myself so that no matter what happens, I can trust that the butterflies will come to me, that happiness will come to me by virtue of me being my best self. So that's the thing. Yes, when you have an issue, ask yourself the question, and if the answer is no, and you still find yourself worrying, if you're still worried about growing up and change and graduating, think about the positivity. Focus on yourself and building your beautiful garden. The butterflies will come to you. Thank you.
our second speaker today is Kate Grissom. Kate will be introduced by Ms. Scharfenberger. Well, there you go. Kate Grissom is the kind of person who seems to have an extra hour in her day. With a packed school schedule and a demanding training routine, she somehow manages to excel at both without missing a beat. Bright, conscientious, and insightful, Kate is known for her ability to handle challenges with poise and precision, even when her to-do list seems impossible. In the classroom, Kate's studious nature shines through. Organized and disciplined, she juggles deadlines and assignments with measured persistence and consistency. Outside of academics, Kate brings the same dedication to her squash training while, particip part while participating in other school activities, balancing her physical and mental commitments with a maturity beyond her years. Her humble nature and work ethic not only help her succeed, but also inspire those around her to do their best. Kate is a rare blend of intelligence, competitiveness, resilience, and beauty inside and out. Whether she's tackling a project, conquering a workout, or being a loyal friend, she approaches everything with an energy and focus that promises great things ahead. When she heads to college next fall, I will miss her excited look when she finds out it is Pesto Tortellini Day, our Locker Bay talks when she needs a little pick-me-up, and her calm, quiet humor during advisory. Kate, thank you for allowing me to be a small part of your journey. You have no idea how bright your future will inevitably be. I cannot wait to watch what you do next. Please welcome Kate Grissom. I started doing art to pass the time during COVID-19 because I needed an activity to fill the monotonous hours I spent at home feeling unproductive and apathetic. The world around me seemed filled with chaos, but I was simultaneously bored and unable to do anything about it. In online school, none of my classes interested me a lot, and socially, I had little interaction with anyone outside of my family and the friends I would spend all day on FaceTime with. I, and I'm sure many of you, felt lonely and as though nothing I did amounted to anything important during that time. However, I had one online art class that did not feel this way. I liked having something to do that would let me stop thinking about what was happening around me, and I liked that no matter what I created, I always had a physical product of my work, proof that I'd completed something. I drew and painted people, places, and objects, really anything I could think of. At first, I did art just to pass the time while I watched a show or talked with someone. But as I began to do it more and more, I realized how relaxing it was and how doing art helped me organize my thoughts and put things into perspective. I was so entranced by how much more positive I felt during, when doing art that I began to try new mediums and types of art. I learned how to sew from my mother, I learned how to draw buildings and do different perspective works, and I learned how to sculpt out of found materials like cardboard and paper. My favorite work that I made during this time was a drawing of Frank Lloyd Wright's building Falling Water. It was nice to have something to do that felt low stakes and unique during a time in my life that was otherwise filled with mostly mundane activities. As the world began to open back up again and life went back to a version of what it was before the pandemic, I promised myself that I'd continue to do art as much as I could because I wanted to maintain how happy I had been while art was a part of my everyday life. But as I got busier and busier and I transitioned into high school and moved cities, I began to do art less and less. I found myself prioritizing art lower and lower on my daily list of activities and having it be replaced with other things like schoolwork and sports and hanging out with friends. One day, I realized I had not picked up a brush or a pencil to draw with in over a month. I was upset because I had found such joy from doing art, so even though I was happy in my life, as I hoped I would be, not doing art anymore felt like a loss. Then I found out about Kmart Couture, a local fundraiser where artists could create a work to be displayed down a runway in a fashion show. I decided to do it because it would give me the motivation to do art again, just as I had had the motivation uh, to do art during quarantine because of my art class. I threw myself into the project and had so much fun. I got to create a design and try a new medium of making clothes. I got to meet some really cool people and I got to challenge my creative side in a new way. I also did it because I wanted to, not because someone else had encouraged me to do it or because it would look good on a college application. 
Um, it was a good break from my other commitments, and it was something I genuinely enjoyed. And while my life was fine before I began the project, it was significantly enriched as a result of the time I spent designing and creating my piece because of the challenges I faced when working in a medium I'd never fully explored. The joy I got from figuring out how to produce the best product I could was really fun. It was great. <laughs> now, after the project's conclusion, I still don't do art in my free time like I used to, um, but having an art class is something I can do whenever I feel the need to de-stress is an incredibly relieving feeling because I know I have a healthy and fun activity that will distract me from any stressors in my life. Art is important to me even though I don't do it on my own often because it allows me to slow down and process how I'm feeling and what is going on around me. Overall, it is important to have activities that you do just for yourself that bring you and only you joy. Whatever that activity may be, whether it is doing art or reading or hanging out with friends or watching movies, you should always be able to have it as a way to de-stress and remind yourself of the happy things in life, especially if you're going through a difficult time. I hope to make art for the rest of my life because I find it soothing and fun, and it is reassuring to me that I have an activity I can rely on to relax. Additionally, it is okay if you get wrapped up in other things and stop doing something you enjoy, as long as your life has balance and is filled with other positive things. You can take as long as a break from something as you want. It is important not to blame yourself for taking a break for neglecting personal hobbies and activities if you have other things going on that you would prefer to do. Self-care is important, and it is good to have healthy outlets to let out stress should you need them, because sometimes things happen that are negative and out of your control, and having a distraction might be the only solution. Stress in high school as you gear up for your next steps post-graduation, whether that's college or something else, can be overwhelming and makes doing anything substantial seem impossible. So if you need to take a break and listen to music for a few hours or draw or paint something nearby, take that time because it is better to take time to yourself and relax than to stay stressed and risk making yourself feel worse or hurting the people around you. I know art will always be a part of who I am, even if I don't do it on my own frequently, uh, but I know it will always be something I can fall back on and I hope that each one of you has a healthy outlet that you can rely on as well. Thank you. Our third speaker today is Brianna Herodin. Brianna will be introduced by her parents, Brennan and Beth Herodin. The snacks look good. I have the honor to introduce Brianna. One thing that comes to mind whenever I think of Brianna is her infectious laugh. When she was little, Brianna would giggle. And it didn't matter what kind of mood you're in, how bad a day you're having, you had to smile or you had to laugh with her too. Beth worked every other Friday very late. So me and the girls would go to dinner. It became quite a tradition and everybody started looking forward to Friday dinner with dad. One day we were leaving a restaurant and Brianna and her sisters were laughing and giggling. <clears throat> and they seemed to be in a rush to get out the door. I asked the girls, what are you laughing at? And Brianna said, dad, keep going. And I asked, what's going on? And Brianna looked at me, she goes, Dad, keep going. Didn't we just stiff the waitress? I was quite taken back and concerned and said, what did you say? She goes, did we just stiff the waitress? Bri was about seven at the time. And I looked at her and I said, what do you think that term means? She said, you know, Dad, we just left without paying. I, I was quite upset. And I said, now hold on, Brianna. Why would you think dad would do something like that? I said, that's a terrible, terrible thing. She goes, well, dad, how did you pay for dinner? I was still very confused. I said, what do you mean? She goes, well, did mom give you any money? <laughs> I was even more confused. She said, well, if mom didn't give you any money, 
how could you pay for dinner? Because mom has all the money. <laughs> I assured her that I'd paid for dinner, but Brianna really wasn't quite convinced because the next time we went out to dinner, she made sure when we walked out the door that mom had given me money. I just have a quick poem that I had written for Brianna. Um, I'm going to actually look at you when I read this. It says, the title of it is Time Flies By. It wasn't long ago that you were very small, running about the house with a smile that made my heart glow. Your giggle was infectious as it is now, and to watch you as a kid's child skipping and playing made me realize that you were going to be a jolly soul. As I stand before you, I am very proud of the young woman you have become. <clears throat> I am here today to celebrate you and to cheer you on as you begin your journey and to let you know that I'll always be your chum. Your work ethic and determination are impeccable and admirable to see. At times I look at you and I see myself and realize all the possibilities you can be. You have recently written about me, the person who has inspired you and it warmed my heart. But my dear daughter, please know that you've inspired me from the very start. Please know that you are, there is no mountain too high that I would climb for you to make you a success and that there are no boundaries that exist to hinder you, only great qualities that you possess. Please remember that a mother's love is unconditional and constant no matter where you go. My blessing for you is that one day you will understand the depth of that love and you can pass it along and it will grow. Brianna, I know you will do great things in this next chapter of your life, but please remember your family is always here for you and loves you for your strife. I will close this poem with a prayer for you that I hope will carry you all the days through. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. I introduce Brianna Harrod. Morning. I did not expect to cry today. <laughs> Maintaining mental well-being is a challenge that many of us face. And for me, that journey started in my childhood. Picture a warm, humid beach where my parents were determined to capture a picture-perfect moment of my sisters and me. We wore flowing white dresses and the wind tugged playfully at our hair and clothes. In that moment of laughter and resistance, there was a hint of unique paths we would each take. While my older and younger sisters thrived in sports, I took a different path, one that taught me lifelong lessons about mental health and balance. Mental health is not just a trending topic. It's, essential, it's an essential part of life. It's an essential part of a fulfilling life. Yet, for many of us, recognizing and prioritizing it is not always easy. Growing up as a middle child, surrounding by siblings who excelled in sports, I felt the subtle pressure to fit into that narrative. Early on, I realized that finding balance was more than just a choice. It was an essential part for my well-being. It became clear that without it, I would struggle to stay true to myself and maintain my mental health. For years, I pushed myself through practices and games, not because I wanted to, but because I felt I should. This disconnect between what I did and what truly made me happy began to affect my mental state. I experienced firsthand how forcing oneself into roles that don't align with who we are can chip away at our sense of self. -worth. The importance of mental health became apparent to me as I learned to say no to what wasn't serving me. Deciding to step away from sports was not an easy choice. It was met with moments of guilt and self-doubt. Familiar feelings to anyone who's chosen to break away from expectations of those around them. But that decision was the first step to prioritizing my mental well-being. It taught me that nurturing mental health involves making hard choices, acknowledging what isn't working, and having the courage to pursue what does. For me, that pursuit led to weightlifting, an activity that didn't demand competition, but instead offered personal growth and peace. Weightlifting became more than just a hobby. 
It was a grounding ritual that allowed me to focus inward, recharge, and clear my mind. This became crucial during the challenges of my freshman and sophomore years, when the pressure of academics, social expectations, and personal doubts weighed heavily. Weightlifting provided an outlet, reminding me that caring for my mental health wasn't just a break from stress. It was essential for building resilience and maintaining balance. But even when I found weightlifting, I wasn't immune to the ever-present comparisons. There were times I would wonder, why am I not like them? Why didn't I pursue the same path as my sisters? This internal battle reflected a struggle that many of us experience, that our, the fear that our choices are somehow inferior, that we don't measure up. These thoughts, left unchecked, can affect our mental health, fostering insecurity and anxiety. Overcoming this mindset required me to redefine success on my own terms. I recognize that true mental well-being isn't about meeting expectations set by others, but about, but about embracing our authentic selves. It's about nurturing what makes us strong and valued, even, it looks, even if it looks different from what others are doing. Beyond finding my place in weightlifting, Another major contributor to understanding my mental health was my first job at a daycare and later at Chick-fil-A. These experiences taught me more than just job skills. They taught me the importance of balancing different aspects of life. Working at the daycare, for example, reminded me that joy can be simple and unfiltered, something we often overlook as, become, as life becomes more complicated. Observing three-year-olds living in the moment was a powerful lesson in how uncluttered mental states allowed me to truly enjoy life. Mental health isn't about managing stress or finding one passion that acts as a coping mechanism. It's about integrating different experiences that contribute to our growth and well-being. When my job at the daycare became seasonal, I took a position at Chick-fil-A, which pushed me outside my comfort zone. Working in fast food came with its own pressures. But it was a learning curve that demonstrated how adapting to new environments can be empowering. Each job taught me resilience and adaptability, showing me that embracing the unfamiliar can fortify mental strength. From the beginning of my journey, the concept of balance was at the heart of every choice I made, even when I decided to step away from sports. Saying no to athletics wasn't just about rejecting one activity. It was my step towards finding a balance that supported my mental health. I realized that true well-being required understanding when to push myself and when to step back to reassess my needs. Throughout high school, I discovered that maintaining mental health is not a one-time achievement, but an ongoing practice. Building routines and seeking support systems that manage stress and emotions became essential to maintaining balance. For me, weightlifting was a crucial pillar that kept me centered. But embracing different experiences, like working various jobs, reinforced that balance. These experiences taught me that relying on sources for fulfillment allowed me to stay grounded and resilient. Being a middle child in a family of achievers, I often felt the need to prove my worth by following a similar path. That realization that my path could look different was liberating. And it taught me that mental health means being honest with yourself. It's understanding when to say no, when to seek help, and when to take a step back to reevaluate. As each one of us prepares to move beyond high school, I ask that you carry these lessons with you. The importance of mental health and balance isn't just something that mattered in this chapter. It's something that will be crucial for the rest of our lives. I hope my story serves as a reminder that prioritizing mental well-being is not just important, it's essential. Embrace who you are, find what makes you thrive, and don't be afraid to carve out your own path, even if it looks different from those around you. Thank you. Let's give all of our speakers one last round of applause.